welcome. I appreciate each of you coming and testifying today. You know, I recognize that a lot of folks in the media are, and even some members of this committee, are praising your companies for taking active steps to police some of the content on your sites. Uh, but I have to note that doing so raises troublesome concerns at the same time, uh, particularly given the percentage of news and political information that Americans receive online through social media or through other online avenues. The prospect of Silicon Valley companies actively censoring the speech or the news content is troubling to anyone who cares about a democratic process with a robust First Amendment. Take one example, uh, which is Google. In December of 2015, a professor at Northwestern University conducted a study analyzing Google search results. He searched for the names of all 16 presidential candidates at the time and discovered that Democrats on average had seven favorable search results among Google's top 10, and Republican candidates had 5.9 positive articles. And indeed, of the major candidates at the time, Hillary Clinton had five positive search results and only one negative on the first page. Donald Trump had four positive and three negative search results on the first page. Bernie Sanders had nine positive results without a single negative result on the first page. And a final candidate, the junior senator from Texas, had a total of zero positive results on the first page. You may well have been citing my colleague from Minnesota on that page. That is outrageous. I, I will note. I will say if there were a Franken filter, that might be popular. That same professor ran a second study and found the vast majority of news outlets that were represented in Google searches were left-leaning. It's not just Google. In 2016, it was revealed that Facebook was, quote, curating the list of trending news stories on their website. According to reports, Facebook workers were artificially spiking conservative stories, including stories about former IRS official Lois Lerner, former Navy SEAL Chris Kyle, and positive stories about conservative politicians. The reports also revealed that stories by conservative outlets like the Washington Examiner or Newsmax that were popular enough to be picked up by Facebook's trending stories algorithm were nonetheless excluded until the New York Times and CNN began covering the same stories. Just last month, Twitter barred Representative Marsha Blackburn from advertising her campaign launch video because it deemed a line about her efforts to investigate Planned Parenthood to be inflammatory. The Susan B. Anthony list recently had a video advertisement against a political candidate blocked on Twitter because it referred to partial birth abortion as being akin to infanticide. Now, that, those are all political positions that people can take in our democratic society. But it is disconcerting if those political positions become a lens through which the American consumers consume news. So I want to ask each of you, do you consider your sites, Mr. Edge and Mr. Stretch, uh, to be neutral public fora? Senator, Senator we, th we think of Facebook as a platform for all ideas, and we, we have boundaries in the sense that we don't permit certain categories of content, such as hate speech. But within those guidelines, we do not in any way discriminate on the basis of viewpoint or ideology. So I, I'm just trying to understand, is that a yes or no, whether you consider yourself to be a, a neutral public forum? 
we don't use, we don't think of it in the terms of neutral because what we're trying to do actually is provide each user a personalized news feed that will be the content that's most interesting to that user. But we do think of ourselves as, again, within the boundaries that I described, open to all ideas without regard to viewpoint or ideology. Mr. Edgett, same question. Uh, free expression and uh, free speech is at the core of, of the Twitter Twitter mission, and we do everything we can to enable that. Uh, obviously, balancing things like Mr. Stretch said against violence, uh, violent threats, or abuse and harassment. But we believe that allowing the public and open platform that the Twitter serves its community is one that's important to debate and discussion. And Mr. Chairman, if I can ask a final question, I'm at the end of my time. I, but I, I how, just, how do you respond? Chairman, Last Chairman, I checked, I'm, I'm not going to object, but I would note that, Chairman, you and I are the only two who sat through all of this today. And I would like to have a chance to ask a question yeah, before you will, vote. Quick over. question. But of course, I'll let Senator go Cruz ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, how do both of you respond to the public concerns and growing concerns that your respective company and other Silicon Valley companies are putting a thumb on the scale of political debate and shifting it in ways consistent with the political views uh, of your employees? Senator, again, we, we think of ourselves as a platform of all idea, for all ideas, and we, and we aspire to that. We are acutely aware of the possibility of unconscious bias across a range of issues, uh, not just politics, and we train our employees on that for that precise reason. We want to make sure that people's own biases are not brought to bear in how we manage the platform. Similar at, Facebook, or at Twitter, we are spending a lot of time training these employees who are looking at user reports on organic tweets. Um, we have stricter policies around advertisements. The one you referenced is an example of that, where uh, since we are serving those ads to, to, to folks who aren't following the accounts and haven't asked to see the content, we want to make sure it's always a positive experience. But even there, we're making tough calls and we're learning from, from mistakes and revising policies and procedures going forward. But, but our goal and our, one of our fundamental principles at the company is to remain impartial.